I was looking at an article yesterday when I was preparing for this message, and it's interesting, I saw one article, and they inter interviewed different kids on how they define marriage. So obviously, that's what we're going to talk about today. So they asked different kids of what, they, what marriage is like, and so this is what Eric said, six years old, marriage is when you get to keep your girl and don't have to give her back to her parents. That's true. Ashley said, I don't want to rush into marriage. It's hard enough just getting through the fourth grade. <laughs> One of you has to be old enough to write checks because when you get married, there's lots of bills to pay. <laughs> marriage is what happens when two people are in love and they go out to eat and they like talking to each other so much their food gets cold and they don't care. So, funny, humorous definition about marriage. And how do people view marriage? It's a good question. Good question to ask. And I know a lot of us can relate to this chart. I'll share this chart to us. How do we view marriage? Some people disdain marriage. So, I'll put a negative sign. And so, whenever they hear the word marriage, they get turned off. You know people like that? And it's possible. And there are people like that. I mean, I don't want to get married. Now, now it's because of, uh, not because of the concept of marriage, but because of the way they were exposed to different kinds of marriage. Or maybe they experienced a traumatic relationship. So a lot of people, or maybe some, they're here on the negative side. They get turned off. They'd rather live alone, or they'd rather live, na lang, live in with their partner rather than get married because it's too complicated. So in the negative side. Now very few people, are actually when they view marriage, they're here. They deify it. Some disdain it. They, they don't like the idea of getting married. They get turned off. But some deify it. When I say deify, they make it like a god. Pastor, ang layunin ng buhay ko ay magpakasal. Yung ganun. The ultimate goal of life is to find my lover, is to find my queen, my princess. That's the ultimate goal for them. So they deify it. They, uh, little do they know, it's an idol already. That uh, they, they get blinded by a lot of things. Or they get blinded, they, don't, they no longer see the things that God is asking them to do. The focus is magpakasal. Just to have a wonderful love life. And so, the reason I share that to us, because that's what we're going to talk about. Whether you're a married couple, or how many of you are young professionals, singles, you're believing God to get married someday? Okay, there's no faith in the room. I, I don't sense faith. Okay, you're believing. Come on now. Okay, that, okay, that partner of yours you're believing still in kids' church now and uh, maybe it's still in the womb or you're going to wait for... I'm just kidding. So whether you're a single professional and you're, you're aspiring for marriage, there's nothing wrong with that. And or maybe for us who are married couples, whether veteran or rookie couples, this, mari this pre preaching about marriage is for us. My goal, as we all have different perspectives on marriage, and the Bible has a lot to say about marriage. The goal of this message is if you're here, that's fine. Disdain. If you're, if you're here disdaining marriage, you, you don't like marriage. My goal, that as you hear the word and what God says about marriage, at least kahit papano, even an inch, you'll, get, you'll go to the center. You're inching closer to the center. Or, sige, maybe, Pastor, no. I, don't, I really don't like marriage. Okay, okay. Maybe centimeter. A centimeter can push you closer to the center. No, Pastor. O, sige, sige. Millimeter. A little. Just to push you closer to the, to the center. The goal is, or maybe if you're here in making marriage your God, your ultimate goal, the, the goal also for you, if you're here, is to be in the center. That means to have a healthy view, to have a balanced view of marriage. Because the Word of God says about marriage. We're going to study Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. Apostle Paul explains marriage in a beautiful way, in a vividly way, where we can apply it in our lives. Now, I respect that there are some people who who feel called to be a celibate. You're familiar with that? Where they, feeling nila talaga, they won't get married and they're fine with that. That's fine. 
That's fine. But disdaining marriage is an extreme side. If you're a Christian, you need to have a healthy view of that. And defying marriage, defying marriage is also on the extreme side. So the goal is to be to have a healthy, balanced view and enjoy life while if you're married, you can enjoy your marriage. And if you're not, you can believe God for a healthy marriage. There's nothing wrong with that. Apostle Paul was actually talking about different kinds of relationships in the book of Ephesians. We're talking about selfless love, and there are, if there's selfless love in your heart, it should manifest in the different kinds of relationships that we have. Ephesians chapter 4, was talk, Paul was talking about having a healthy relationship in the church, unity in the body of Christ. That's what, that's what he was saying. In Ephesians chapter 5, in the passage we're studying today, it talks about marriage, husband and wife, to have a healthy, growing, thriving marriage. But also in Ephesians 6, it talks about um, parents to children relationship, familial relationship. And then Paul extends even further, talking about another kind of relationship, boss to a staff relationship, employer to employee relationship. So it affects all kinds, all levels of relationships. Today, let's talk about what the Bible says about marriage based on Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. What, we're going to answer this question. What is marriage supposed to be? Or what is marriage like? So if you disdain marriage, it's good to have a, what the Bible says about marriage. If you're making marriage a God, it's also good to go back to the Word because it's not a God. It's not your ultimate purpose. Let's look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now for in our world today, and if you're a wife, sometimes it's hard to submit to your husband, right? Right? Sometimes you don't trust your husband's leadership. Okay? Pastor, he's not a planner. He's not a planner. Okay? I schedule things. Okay? So it's hard. But the commandment is to submit, to trust your husband's leadership. But take note of this. As to the Lord. Okay, wives, be careful, or when you get married in the future, don't say, bit, don't sound bitter, right? You can sound bitter when you're submitting to your partner. You can say, okay, I'm submitting to you, not because I love you, but because I love the Lord. Okay, that's too harsh. <laughs> when you're fighting also, husband, make sure you don't quote this verse and say, in Jesus' name. <laughs> I did that when I was, I kind of lost my fruit when, okay, my wife is not here, she attended already. <laughs> so... I lost my fruit, and then I said, submit. In Jesus' name, submit. <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work. The, it got worse. <laughs> but the, the role, it says here, the role of a, a partner, of a woman, of a wife, is to learn to submit to the husband, to the husband you love. And in our world today, it's hard because women are empowered now. Uh, you have your own career. You, have, you can make your own money. You have your own plans. Maybe some of us, we've been single for a long time, so you're used to living alone. No one dictating your life, right? So it's hard. But the commandment of God in the role in the marriage is to submit. The next verse, it says, how about for the husband? It's the head of the wife. That doesn't mean that the man is higher and the woman is just a second-class citizen. That doesn't mean what, that doesn't, what the Bible is saying. It's not what the Bible is saying. What you're saying is it's the role, the husband is the leader, the wife supports. It's the role. It doesn't mean the wife is mute and will not say anything. That's impossible. <laughs> Women always have opinions. So that doesn't, what, what the Bible says, it's just a difference of roles. But when God sees you, okay, look at the opposite sex. If you're, just in case you're sitting beside an opposite sex, a man or a woman, you're the same. It's just the God sees you the same, equal. But for the husband, he's the head of the family, and even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, I'm already emphasizing some simile, if I'm not mistaken. Simile or same parallel relationship. Talking about marriage, but you'll see those keywords, as the. As the Lord relates to the church, as the church relates to, the, to God. 
So you see a parallel relationship here. In verse 24, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, this is harder. Well, it depends. It's a matter of perspective. Husbands, love your wives. Okay, that's... Now, it's not conditional. It's unconditional. Whether your wife reciprocates or not. Huh. Whether your wife, or maybe if your wife has mood swings, because it happens. Uh, women are complicated creatures. It's very, the way the Lord designed them is very intricate. <laughs> very perfectly designed. <laughs> so whether the wife has mood swings or not really having a good day, the husbands, the dads are commanded to love her, to love our spouses unconditionally. That's harder. Now, there's a parallel relationship as what? As Christ loved the church. As Christ loved you and me unconditionally. And gave himself. Oh, there's another thing. It's not just loving unconditionally, but there's a part of giving up. Giving himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Because that's what God, Christ does to us. He makes us more like Him. In fact, when you look at the symbolism in the Bible, that our relationship with God is we're like His bride. The church is His bride. Jesus is our bridegroom, our groom. So He's making a parallel statement here, an example. In verse 27, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So you would see two kinds of relationships here. Paul will bounce back and forth, talks about marriage, how, how you run your marriage. Wife submit, husband love. And then he bounces on the other side, how God relates to the church. So what is marriage like according to this passage? Well, it's actually an evident picture or a display of God's love. A marriage covenant is a picture of the way God relates to His church, which is nice. That's deep. Did you know that the marriage covenant was the first human-to-human -human relationship that was invented? When you look at the Bible, it's not friendship or best friends, or nowadays we call it besh. It wasn't, that's, that's not the first form of relationship that God created. When God created the universe and the earth and everything in it, and on the sixth day, He created Adam, and then on the sixth day, He created Eve, right? That was the first relationship that He invented. It's not besh. It's not best friend. It's not social media followers or contacts. The first highest form of relationship that He invented here on earth was a marriage covenant. Did you know that the first love story was actually in Genesis 1 already? Genesis 2, when Ad, you know why woman is called woman, right? Because when God, well, they say, <laughs> they say women are better because, you know, women didn't, did not come from the mud or dust. They came from the rib, right? And the man came from the dust. That's why men are not civilized. We don't take a bath. We love not to take a bath. We, we're dirty, right? <laughs> because we came from the dust. But you know why Adam called Eve, woman, because when God created Eve, he was shocked. I mean, biologically, they're different, and Eve was probably gorgeous, and then the reaction of Adam was, whoa! Man. Very deep explanation. So talking about the marriage covenant in Genesis 2, okay, Genesis 1, that was the first invention you think marriage was invented by Nicholas Sparks or Ernest Hemingway? Marriage was actually invented by God. That's why I believe to some of you, or to all of us, married or single, God is the author of our love story. Don't ever think, accidental lang, pastor. Yan, yan, naku. When you look at your partner, wala, napadaan lang. Nagkataon, siya lang available, di ba? Sometimes you think that way, I mean... Oh man, last option, I mean, coincidence. 
Sometimes that's what we think, random chance. I married her, that's it. I fell in love and now I'm miserable. I mean, <laughs> probably that's your reaction now. It's coincidence, random chance. Let me tell you, God is the author of your love story. Because in Genesis 1, who brought Eve to Adam? It's God. Not only that, in Genesis 2, when I say the first love song, oh, theologians, no, this is not a joke. The theologians <laughs> were saying that when, when Adam saw Eve, he described Eve in a way. In, if I'm not mistaken, you can look at your Bible. Genesis 2, it says, uh, flesh of my flesh. Remember that? How It was actually a song. So imagine, the first song that was uttered in creation was not a worship song. It was actually a love song. Can you imagine? God is not a KJ God. Maybe you have a thought, God is, you know, God is too serious. He doesn't want you to fall in love. No, 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 no. God is the creator of, a love, of your love story. Not only that, when you talk about marriage in the Old Testament, did you know that he will use the marriage relationship to illustrate his relationship with the Israelites? Diba, God had a covenant with the Israelites as a nation. They're, you know, they're the, uh, they, God considered this nation as his own. He used marriage covenant, the relationship, to illustrate that example that it's in, unbreakable, it's in, they're inseparable. That's why when the Israelites sinned against God and worshipped other idols, prophetic books and prophets will utter they were unfaithful. And when do you use the word unfaithful? Only in the context of marriage. So my point is this. When you look at the Bible, marriage has weight. It's the highest form of relationship. God invented marriage and it's good to be married. Even though it takes a lot of work. Marriage is a blessing. And now, you will look at in the, the passage that we just read. When the commandment of God says, Wives, submit to husband. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and as the church. It's just like, to me, it's equivalent. It's the same parallel. It's, he's paralleling the meaning of relationship. It's the same. That our covenant with God is like a marriage covenant inseparable. When you talk about marriage, when does you, uh, when do you, when is the only time when a husband and wife separate? When the husband farts a lot, pastor. <laughs> when the husband is stubborn, pastor. No. When? Death. That's how, cov that's how the marriage covenant is so strong. It's in break. But that's why the writers of the Bible will always parallel this marriage covenant into our covenant relationship with God. Because even if you make some mistakes, how many of you make mistakes? Sin against God. All the time, pastor. All the, every minute, pastor. Wag naman. God still loves you. How many of you are grateful for that? He's still faithful. Right? And that's what a marriage covenant is as well. I'm not a doctor love. I'm not an expert. I'm just a rookie person here when it comes to marriage. I'm just, but I have to be careful. Three years, almost three years of being married. I learned one, I learned a lot. <laughs> but there's one, <laughs> there's one lesson that I want to share to us. And just to, just to reinforce this point, Carla and I realized one thing for our marriage to thrive and continue and for us to be happy. We learned, we learned it the hard way. I learned it the hard way. We learned the power of forgiveness. When, there are, when I offend her most of the time and when she offends me, we learn to forgive. That's one of those many, many things I've learned. And most of the time, I say sorry. I'm the one who says sorry. You know why? Because I'm humble. Then a joke lang. You know why? Because women have a belief they're always right. I don't know. It's mysterious. It's phenomenal. Wives think they're always right. And you know why I have a big tummy, right? I learned to swallow my pride. So, in a marriage. So, anyway. 
Anyway, so there was one time I remember we had a heated argument. Argument. I mean, I really lost my pastor badge. You know, I. Wala na pastor pastor, ba yung? I, I lost my fruits. Okay, stop it. What's the matter? What's the problem? I was raising my voice already. And then I found out I'm, I'm, I was the one who was at fault. May kasalanan. I'm, I was wrong. For the men, it's normal, right? If George, you have an offense, I have an offense against you, right? I, or you, I have offended you and I apologize. For the men, it's easy. Huh? Sorry. Oh, pare. Hug, buddy. Hug. <laughs> okay na. Okay? But I realized for the opposite sex, it's quite different. So, okay, 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 okay. I said, we were arguing and she, she was already uh, frustrated, uh, angry also. And I said, okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. You know how she reacted. I thought she will forgive me and hug me and, and then we'll kiss, right? And then, no, 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 that, it, it didn't come easy. You know, she said, uh, when, she, when I said sorry, she said, so ganong kasimple lang? Whoa. Yeah, you have to be thankful. It's very rare for a man to admit his mistakes, you know. Ito na nga eh, oh. Your Lord, your Lord is already taking the humble side. <laughs> but then, no, you know what we should always say? Ah, I need time. Whoa, oh, I need time. Okay. It's the same thing with me, right? Uh, when she asks for forgiveness, I always have a hard time forgiving. So there was one time I was driving and, oh man, uh, it taught me a lot in marriage. That's why I have white hair now. But you know, when I think about it, when every time we have those arguments, and Carla also knew it and learned the lesson. We both learned the lesson of forgiveness. So I was marinating one time in a heated argument. Sometimes men marinate also when they drive. Your flashback. There's flashback. I was supposed to say this. So I was marinating it and trying to flashback. But then the Lord spoke to me and said, you just, you just have to forgive. You just have to let go. And then I had to realize, wow, so hard to forgive. Right? It's so hard to forgive. And then I start connecting it to my relationship with God. And the Lord spoke to me, are you, you're perfect now? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry, Lord. When Carla asks for forgiveness, she, asks, she tells me, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to retaliate. And she said, ganun lang kasimple. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> when, nah, 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 not that simple. Not that easy. But you know what she'll tell me? Why? The Bible says to forgive, right? To forgive. <laughs> okay, okay. And so, but one time I was driving and I said, wow, it's so hard to forgive. So hard to forgive. I'm sure Carla was so patient with me. Thank you, honey, for being so patient with me. But then I start to connect it and say, wow, how many times have I sinned against you, Lord? Wow, Lord, it must have been so hard for you to forgive 7 billion people every day. You know what my point is this? A marriage covenant gives you an idea. A right, ideal marriage covenant gives you an idea of how great the love of God is for us. Whatever happens in my marriage, some things, God uses it for sure so that He can illustrate how He loves me so much and how I should submit to Him. That's how Apostle Paul vividly describes marriage. That's why marriage is a good thing. You can believe God for a great marriage, a thriving marriage, not perfect, there can be arguments too, right? There might be some trials and storms you'll face, but the Lord will use those things so that you can have a greater perspective of what God is doing also when it comes to your relationship with Him. Evident display of God's love. Verse 28, it says, In the same way husbands love their should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ. Again, a parallel relationship. Just as Christ does to us. We were just singing a while ago, the love of God. He's encouraging us. I'm sure whenever we worship Him, He speaks to you. He encourages you. Just like how a marriage should be run. Husbands should speak words of life to the wife. Wives should do it as well. 
So just as Christ does the church, but in verse 30, it says, because we are members of his body. In verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father. This is the, this is the basics of marriage. Shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You're one. When you're married, you're one. In verse 32, it says, the mystery is profound. It is. How can two physical bodies be one? How can two different persons be one? And I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband as one. Do you know, do you know when you look at the repetitive words in the passage we're looking at now, you would see words that are repeated a lot of times, the word love. Christ and the church, it's repeated a lot of times also. And it only implies that what you're talking about, when you're talking about marriage, there should be an exclusive devotion with your spouse. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. You're not just talking about literally leaving your house, even if you're a mama's boy or papa's boy or papa's girl. You need to make them secondary. Some marriage fail because they fail to prioritize them and they prioritize what the in-laws will say. A husband should not be beholden to his family anymore and it's the same thing with a wife. As much as you love your family. So, in-laws, your family, your parents and your in-laws, they become secondary and third. Far from being first. Of course, the first is God. But when I say primary, it's the husband and the wife, the spouse. Not only that, in our Philippine context, not just the in-laws should be third and fourth at the bottom. It, the, the friends, your barkada, your besh, should also be third and fourth. Your priority is your spouse. And then career and money should be secondary and third as well. That's what you mean by, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And that's what you mean by saying, if it's exclusive, that's what you mean by one flesh. Oh, I forgot to mention, even the pictures of your ex, if it's still in your library or in your drawer, you have to throw that away. I had to be careful. Even the uh, messages in the inbox, if you're old, old email, if you're still using a friendster or whatever, you have to erase that. Because your husband now, your spouse, becomes the priority. One flesh. It's a marriage covenant. Exclusive devotion with your spouse. I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. A German martyr said this. And who's the writer of the Cost of Discipleship book? It is not your love that sustains the marriage, but from now on when you're marriage, it's the marriage that sustains your love. Ooh, kind of deep. I saw a Facebook picture. And you know, every time it's uh, February Love Month, we Filipinos love, you know, even the Jollibee viral ads. I know there were a lot of memes. And so you know what I'm talking about. There's a picture a few weeks ago I saw, uh, since it Love Month is coming, someone said this, I tried. Wala na talagang spark. <laughs> Sometimes we think the spark sustains the marriage, right? The attraction sustains the marriage. The emotional desire, affection, sustains the marriage. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Apostle Paul is saying what they're saying. It's the same thing. Let's go back. It's not your love that sustains the marriage. But the fact that you, I have a covenant with you, there should be love. The fact that I'm married to you and when I see you and you have a lot of morning stars in your eyes, it doesn't matter. I will deliberately and make, my, and make a commitment to love you no matter what. That's the commitment. But pastor, I don't feel anything anymore. No, it's not the feeling. It's not the feeling that sustains the marriage. It's a covenant. You know, my friend told me, bro, when there's a time where just you don't feel like loving your wife, when there's just a time that sometimes uh, you don't want to show affection to your wife, what he told me was this, before I got married, he told me, go back and remember the date 
May 25, 2014. The day you made the commitment, forsaking all others, cling only to her as long as you both shall live. And we said, I do, and when you exchange those vows, that's the commitment, that's the covenant you made. So when you, because in light of that, you will deliberately be faithful to your wife and continuously show affection even if the return of investment is slow. <laughs> Takes time. Because that's what marriage covenant is all about. Did you know that's how God loved you and me? There was a time where we were running away from God, but yet He consistently showed love to us. And then after X number of years, you're here in church serving God because you responded to the call. But little did you know that the Lord was loving you unconditionally, consistently from the very beginning. Even if you were not reciprocating, it's just now you reciprocated this love. That's the picture of a marriage covenant. Unfortunately, in our world today, marriage has been twisted, marriage has been perverted. That's why young people and other people, older people, are turned off with the idea of marriage because they no longer have a peg. They no longer don't have a clear grasp of what a godly marriage is all about. And this is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 is saying. It's the covenant that sustains the love. Exclusive devotion with your spouse, easier said than done. Right? Exclusive and consistent 365 days in a year, it's hard. Because just like what I told us a while ago, it's draining. It's tiring. Sometimes it's exhausting, right? Especially if your emotions and your mental or whatever, your situation is affecting you from doing that. Let me share to you a story so that this principle will be more clear to us. A few days ago, I got rem uh, someone, I, I heard a story of a couple. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. So they were together for 11 years. So when they were together for 11 years, five years during those 11 years, they were actually living in. But they were not Christians. So what they did, uh, both of them, one of the, part of their motive is for them just to be filled up with love because there's an emptiness in each of their hearts. They were siphoning. Nagsisipsipan lang nung pagmamahal in Tagalog. Okay? I'm making you my source. The, the source was them. Just to fill up their emptiness, that lack. And thinking that relationship will fill them up. And so they try. They try. They they fought for it for 11 years, five years they were living in, and then after, they, they were fighting, with a lot, there were a lot of issues and troubles, and so they parted ways, they gave up. Now, of course, they were brokenhearted, the woman, thank God, under, because of God's sovereignty, the woman had a friend, and it so happened her friend was attending church, was a Christian, so the friend wanted to reach out to her, so usually brokenhearted people are very open to the gospel. And so the office mate, her office mate brought her to church here in the fort. She heard the preaching. To cut the long story short, she became a Christian, surrenders her life to Jesus, experiences the grace and the faithfulness of God. Gradually, she got discipled. And before, she, she used to get the love from the relationship, from her previous relationship. But now, because she has, she has a relationship with God, she understood that the emptiness can only be filled by Christ's love. When she got healed and was able to move on, they were no longer in a relationship. She tried contacting her ex-boyfriend. Good. It was good that the ex-boyfriend responded to. And so, but they were not in a relationship. Okay? They were just friends. So she brought her ex. To cut the long story short as well, the, the guy also got saved. Surrenders his life to Jesus. So simultaneously now, they were just friends. Simultaneously, they were growing in love with God. They were being discipled. And just last year, of course, God is the author of every love story, right? The guy had an impression in his heart. Maybe it's time to pursue her again. The eternal flame. 
the fire was rekindled again. The attraction. And so she, he courted. He, he laid down his intentions again and he pursued the girl. But now it's different because both of them are filled with God's love. And whenever they get tired, they will just run to the right source, to God. And so they, they, they were in a relationship last year and you know what? Now they're getting married March. They're getting married March. They got engaged before 2016 ended. And so they were telling this to a pastor, to one of our pastors, Pastor Christian. They were sharing this story. They said, you know, Pastor, before when we were in a relationship, 11 years, we, we, we clearly saw the difference. Because before, we were trying to get each other's love, thinking it will satisfy us. That's why our insecurities caused us to fight a lot. Our emptiness caused us to fight a lot. That's why it didn't work. But now, Pastor, we see the difference very clear. Because now, before we got into a relationship and before entering this marriage covenant, we were filled already with God's love. So both of us are emotional, he emotionally healthy. Because we're emotionally healthy because of our relationship with God, then we started entering into this, about to enter this marriage covenant. They so clearly saw the difference. This is what it means to have an exclusive devotion with your spouse. To be able to have ex extend exclusive devotion to someone, you need to be filled by someone else. By God, who's perfect in love. Whether you're a man or you're a woman, if it gets filled, listen, you can gradually extend that to others. And that's how we answer this question. What is marriage like? It's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But what does it say? Be filled with the Spirit of God. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, so on and so forth. Be filled with God. When He fills your emptiness, then you'll be able to have, extend that to your spouse and to your future partner. Then we can believe God for a great marriage. Amen? We can still believe God for a great marriage. It's an evident display of God's love. And it's also an exclusive devotion towards your spouse. That's how the Bible answers this question. So if you're disdaining marriage, I hope you can be inspired. Even if you didn't have a peg. Even if you come from a broken family. You can still believe God for a successful marriage in the future. Or maybe you're going through some tough times as a married couple. You can still believe God that He will fill you with love. So that you can walk and thrive in your marriage. Now, if you're defying marriage, no, the primary relationship is what? It's God. Bonus na lang yung marriage. If you have Christ, how many of you believe you're complete? You're complete. And so wherever strata you can come from, wherever point you come from, have a healthy view of marriage. And my exhortation for us is be filled with His Spirit. Amen? Isn't God good? How many of you are thankful that God is good? Amen? He loves us unconditionally. Let's all stand. In fact, let's bow down our heads and let's pray. Lord, bless our week this week. Fill us with your love, your faithfulness, every insecurity in our hearts, every void, every emptiness. Lord, you're, you'll be filling that. So for every boyfriend and girlfriend that's represented here, I pray that you would be in the center. I pray, Lord, that they will not siphon each other's love, but they now realize you are the source. And so that it will make it, you will make it a healthy relationship. Pray for every married couple here. Strengthen it, Lord. Let there be a spirit of unity always in their marriage. That their children will see that it's still possible to have a great and thriving marriage. May our marriages be, in, be an inspiration to the world. That they will see you in our marriage, Lord God. Even for young people who are believing for marriage in the future. Let them aspire and believe for something great and thrive. But first and foremost, you would fill us to overflowing with your love and your faithfulness. So that we can extend that to our office mates, to the people we know, to our loved ones this week. Can we all lift up our hands, Lord? The, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord face, shine His face upon us. And may the Lord give you peace. Bless our week this week. 
May your righteousness, your peace, your joy surround us, Lord. Bless all the things we'll be doing this week, Lord. Protect us even as we go home. We praise you. We thank you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.